You're listening to the Happy Doc Student Podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing clarity to the often mysterious doctoral process. Do you feel like you're losing your mind? Let me and my guests show you how to put more joy in your journey and graduate with your sanity, health, and relationships intact. I'm your host, Dr. Heather Fridger, and today I welcome Rhett Lawson Mohajer. Rhett is a psychoanalyst, psychotherapist, and musician. Rhett, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. We were talking before we started recording here about how you came to be a clinician because you didn't start out knowing that your passion was understanding the human psyche. That's right. First time I went to college, I studied chemical engineering. It, it really didn't resonate. I, well, I went to school. I really didn't enjoy what I was learning. So I did not really work in that field. And I completed some training. I became a teacher. So I taught IELTS classes, topical classes to adults. And that went on for over a decade and a half. But my passion was always about human mind, knowing why I like what I like, why other people like what they like, why, why, why do they do what they do? So at some point I just decided to take the plunge, go back to school. So I went back to college, started from undergrad studying psychology, then to the graduate school and then the doctoral program. And we were chatting about, there were so many things that we could cover today, but a topic that really sounded interesting to me was for us to have a conversation about research methods, because you were sharing your take on qualitative versus quantitative for the field of psychology. And because we come from different backgrounds, I thought that would be such interesting conversation to have. Now, you did your doctoral project using a qualitative framework. Why don't we start by you explaining to the audience, these may be new terms to some people, what qualitative is and how you used it for your doctoral project. Typically, their research projects are like qualitative, quantitative, or some people use mixed methods. So for me, I use a phenomenological qualitative research method because I really wanted to understand the subjective experiences of the individuals that I want to interview. I, I interviewed musicians. What is important was the subjective experiences. So I did not want to get into like questionnaires and people check marking one to 10, how you feel about this, good, bad, or, and, and numbers like this, because me, that is based on at least one of the assumptions that people have the same understanding of the same sentences and the same words. And from where I'm coming from, like looking at it from a psychoanalytic standpoint, that's not the case at all. We say the same sentence, we use the same word, but people mean different things or feel the different things, not the same. So. so I would love to stop there and unpack that a little bit more because you actually said so much. In general, I will explain to students, qualitative, think of it as words, as an experience. Quantitative, think of it as numbers. You're a little more of a, of a bean counter, for lack of a better phrase, which is the discipline and the tradition I was brought up in through my graduate program. But I loved how you said a sentence can mean different things to different people. So for example, you could say on a scale from one to 10, how satisfied are you with life? And I think what I hear you saying is my seven may not mean the same thing as your seven. That's right. Furthermore, satisfied self could mean different things. I mean, for example, we can have a question like this in the questionnaire. Do you feel uncomfortable walking in the street in dark? or something like that. And then you may say, or one may say, yes, no, or on scale one to 10 or one to five. Yes, no, or no, like completely agree, completely disagree or things like that. But then I would say, well, hang on a second. What do you mean by uncomfortable? You say uncomfortable. So what is uncomfortable? 
Because if it's a questioner, then the assumption is that everyone will come comfortable is uncomfortable. When I say, well, what do you mean by uncomfortable? Then one person may say that, well, you know, it's pretty natural. There is crime. So of course I feel uncomfortable. So that's, there is the association of crime. But then another person says that, you know what? I really can't see well and dark. So just like, I feel uncomfortable. Another person may say that, you know what? I, when I'm in the dark, like darkness, that kind of, uh, I, I find it sexually arousing and I feel uncomfortable being aroused in a public setting. So all these people feel uncomfortable, but let me like uh, really three different worlds when it comes to being uncomfortable. Now, when I was in graduate school, the program I was in, as I was sharing with you before we were recording, was heavily quantitative. All the courses I took were on tests and measurements, statistics, different analytical strategies. I graduated with my PhD in psychology without ever taking one qualitative research course. Now, granted, this was 20 years ago. I think that might be a little more unusual nowadays. But those types of questions you were asking, hey, how are people defining this for themselves were always kind of nagging in the back of my mind and why years later when I began to team up with other researchers who did qualitative research, I found it so fascinating. So I want to say there are many people listening out there who are in quantitatively focused programs, who are thinking of their proposal in terms of quantitative measures, and there's certainly a place for that. But sometimes the research questions really do beg for this qualitative approach. So I'm wondering if you would share what you did your doctoral project on and the types of questions you were asking. I worked on the subjective experiences of musicians during improvisation. So I wanted to know whether music improvisation impacts the psyche or not, helps with the healing process or not, and if it does, how. So I use Ethereum, like sometimes some, uh, some researchers use a couple of theories. I used one, I use Fairbairn's theory of personality structure. So grouped my question into improvising and tunes or songs that uh, musician has got positive associations with and the ones that's got negative associations with there is some sort of like they they evoke positive memories or evoke negative memories and how improvising through these experiences helps them or restructures the psyche because that's the that's the aim in, in therapy so that's that's why I interviewed musicians. They were musicians who had at least 10 years of experience of a musical instrument and had some self-claimed improvisational skills. So improvisation for, for the purpose of healing and therapy, improvisation does not have to be really something complex. It doesn't have to be like hundreds of uh, jazz chords and that's all the ninth and 11th and 13 chords. I mean, like we, we really don't need that. So whatever connects with the emotion that the person is experiencing at that moment, that could heal in. That's what I'm saying. And through your interview process, how many musicians did you interview? 20. And what did you find? What were some of the main themes that emerged from that? interview process, which by the way, was probably incredibly time consuming. Qualitative research tends to take much more time than quantitative research. It is. That is why maybe unfortunately, sometimes that research done by government funded research centers, it's just like quantitative because then they can say, okay, so we sent out 2000 or 3000 questionnaires to I don't know, 3,000 people, and it took us one hour to get all the results, and then we started doing all the maths. And if, if you really want to do that in qualitative, that takes years and years. So there, the result was that music improvisation actually does impact the psyche. And in short, we can say it can reverse the impacts of trauma, because the way I look at it in theory that I use is that like everyone's psyche 
an ego in that sense, in terms of object relations, everyone's psyche is split. So just the difference between one individual to another is how, how deep that split goes, because no one in the world has got that perfect parent, perfect life, so no one's perfect. And that helps, improvisation does help okay, with the trauma, reverses the impacts of that. Which is a huge, significant, and fascinating finding. What I want to kind of pause here to recognize is, is there may be some people listening who think, oh, wow, qualitative research. I can just interview people and see what I find. But you had a theory that this was based in, right? This isn't just going out and surveying your, your friends and your family members when we're talking about a doctoral level capstone project. This is based in previous research. The research that you were looking at related to trauma, to music, you found a theory. It was based in the theory. That theory helped inform the questions that you asked and so on and so forth. I just want to make sure I, I run across a lot of newer students who will say, oh, I know for my doctoral project or my dissertation, I want to do interviews because that sounds easier. And so I just want to make sure we're spending some time really elucidating and revealing not only the, the work and the energy that goes into this, but the strong science foundation that you have before you even think of the questions that you would ask. That's right. I mean, like, it's, it's really time consuming. So that's one thing. It takes a lot of time. In particular, I used unstructured interviews. So there could be like structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. I use unstructured because I, I want it as much as possible to be similar to free association. That's a technique in psychoanalysis. So if, if the musician I was interviewing, if the participant just went on telling me something else about, yeah, you know, when, when I was doing this or improvising on that tune, this happened, or that's how I feel, I would not stop the participant, just let the person go on. And then based on what the participants say, I might just ask and say, well, so you say, you suddenly felt something in your chest. What do you mean by that? So tell me more about that. So, so that was pretty much unstructured. So there were interviews that were 30 minutes, but there were ones that were like 90, 100, 110, and so on minutes. So they were long and it, it's time consuming. Furthermore, as you pointed out, I mean, the researcher really needs to have one, one theory that is really strong, has been used before a number of times, at least in various areas of that field. And then also have some knowledge of the other part of the research. For example, for me, there was the psychoanalytic aspect and there is the musical part. I, I wouldn't go to a qualitative research not knowing the area. And that is such a critical point. I find myself telling students a lot, you need to be in the research. You need to understand what it is that people before you have already found, what we still need to know before you just say right out the gate, I'm going to do qualitative or I'm going to do quantitative. And for heaven's sakes, please think twice about mixed methods. I am never a fan of that for a demonstration project because it is like doing two dissertations or two doctoral projects. So as you're listening to Rhett and I talk, you might think, wow, well, I want to collect numbers and I want to collect interviews. And to that, I say, good for you, but do that after your doctor fill in the blank. Pick one for your demonstration project. Prove to the university you've met the qualifications required for their degree program. Get out there and then do your work. So, Rhett, something I would love to talk about is how did you decide on phenomenological? Because there are different traditions. People might just think, oh, qualitative's asking questions, but there are actually different types of qualitative research. Well, there are a couple of things. For, for me, working on narratives, I mean, like that was something that I liked that would be like going through books, documented material. The program that I completed, Although it was acceptable to, to do this research, but it was offered through the 
Department of uh, Behavioral Sciences, not Social Sciences. So it really depends what department's really offering the program, because sometimes departments lean toward one or the other. My understanding is that when the program is offered through the Department of Social Sciences, and there are more students wanting to do like using material, old journals, new journals, like old case histories and things like that. And maybe doing behavior sciences, they're more into case studies, phenomenological, although the other one is also acceptable. So I, I thought about these two. And phenomenological study basically is the one that hopefully gives the researcher access to the subjective experiences of the participants because that's basically that's an analogical study and it's it's based on its philosophical standpoint so what is what is really important and like maybe another important thing in qualitative research is that each of the methods sort of like associated and based on one philosophical worldview so i would recommend also to go to those ones just explore them a little bit and see if the philosophical worldview resonates i mean it might be easier for for researchers and students coming from philosophy or got some background if some of them have done some reading the ones who haven't it's it's also important to know that to know where that has come as you talk, I just envision an onion with layers coming off where as the audience is listening, they're realizing, okay, there's these two kind of camps, qualitative, quantitative, but just like with quantitative where you may have a correlational design or a pretest, post-test or longitudinal, qualitative also has nuances. And then those are situated in your discipline, in the program that you're in. And it really speaks to taking time to do research and understanding what would be acceptable for your program, what would fit with your program goals, but also with your long-term goals, because this was right up your alley. I'm assuming, do you use music in your therapy? Well, sometimes, I mean, and not, uh, not all people I work with are musicians. Some are, but I, I, I am a strong advocate of using various forms of symbolization. So it could be music, painting, drawing, even poetry. Because one of the goals, I wouldn't say the ultimate goal, but of course one of the goals is to be able to to symbolize the the emotion that is sort of like stuck in the body and can come out. So there are various ways to do that. Like music is one, painting, drawing and drama, and, and of course, poetry and writing, because using words, that's also one way of symbolization. So what I'm hoping everyone is hearing here is we've got a coin, and this coin is called your doctoral capstone research method. And on one side, we have qualitative, which meets certain goals and will have certain outcomes. And on the other side, we have quantitative. So I don't know if you would agree, Rhett, that they're both sides of, of a coin that we have here, because I know before the show, you were expressing some passion about qualitative. And then I said, but my, my dissertation was quantitative. But what I really want to encourage the audience to ponder you know, regardless of your program, Rhett was coming from an applied psychology program, right? And you are a psychoanalyst. That is what you do for a living. We've got listeners who are in the field of education and in the field of business, computer science, literature. So really taking time to understand how these methods are used in your discipline, what types of questions do they best answer before you make any decision? What would, what would break my heart is if someone listens to this podcast and decides right here, right now, that's it. I'm doing one or the other, but really, really taking time to dig in, have conversations with your peers, with your faculty, and 
let those conversations and let the literature drive and inform the method you choose. Please never sit in a class or a residency and say, well, I don't know what I'm doing for my project, but I know I'm using qualitative because I hate numbers, for example. <laughs> please, please don't do that. Red flags will be flying for your faculty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. I would, I would recommend listening to this podcast, but also to probably 50 other ones and, and then do a lot of reading and, and also doing some online search and looking at various qualitative and quantitative dissertations, just, just how they're structured, how they present the material, new ones and old ones. Same way, like which, which one really resonates, which one you like better. And I love that word resonates. What's resonating with you, maybe at even a subconscious or unconscious level, Red, if we could go there. What I always recommend is as you're doing this reading or you're listening to podcasts, doing your Google search, you're thinking, if I had a, a party, a dinner party, and I could invite 10 researchers, practitioners in my field, who would they be? Who are my people? As you work your way through your program and you identify these people, I think it becomes a lot more straightforward and clear in terms of maybe the types of methods or the discipline specific kind of foundational work that you're going to use to draw on to move your field forward. So, Brett, do you have a favorite quote that you would like to share with the audience before we sign off today? Well, one of my favorite quotes is, what's here is not here. It's just there without a T. So for me, that's pretty much a psychoanalytic quote because when we look at it here, we think it's in here, it's in here, and now it's never in here. Well, it is in here, but it's just part of it. It's there. It's in the past. There is a connection between past and present. We've got to look at the whole thing. And that's how the, the psyche works. And I like the, that the name of our discipline is psychology. And I really do my best to keep the psyche in psychology. What a great way to end today's show. Rhett, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to have in the show notes ways that people can contact you, but also you were on another YouTube, an interview you did with the International Society of Applied Psychoanalysis. And also I will put your doctoral project title down there in the show notes so that people could look for that and check out the amazing work that you did. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Rand. Thanks so much for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Until then, if you're looking for more ways to invite joy in your journey, check out the free resources at expandyourhappy.com. You'll find downloads like an article I wrote titled The Doctoral Journey, 12 Things You Need to Know That They Probably Won't Tell You. You'll also find a PDF that organizes all podcasts by the seven steps detailed in the Happy Doc Student Handbook, which you can also find on the website. Finally, if you're looking for a Happy Doc Student swag, I've got that too. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and YouTube channel. And if you want to make my day, rate and review so that together we can change the way doctoral education is delivered and experienced. Hey, one more thing. Just a quick reminder that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only.